So just a couple of announcements. Uh, today's class is optional, as I've already announced, but we return to sort of full bore Physics 101 this evening with uh, our clinic. It is my expectation that the clinic will be run by the regular clinic staffers. I'm in the process of checking with them about that. If they're not able to do it, then I will do it myself. Uh, and then Friday's class will be a normal required class. We will observe all of the um, changes to the course that I've already announced. Uh, so that means, for example, that I will be dropping your lowest two problem sets and the lowest of your exam one or two grades. Um, of course, I hope that the grades are only a fraction of your motivation for wanting to learn this material. So I encourage you very strongly to do all the problem sets and to do exam two, taking the exam as an important educational experience. Um, and so uh, I will push for that pretty strongly. Uh, another part of the, the previous things that is still in effect is that I will grant automatically any requests for extensions, but I do ask that you make those requests. So I will grant them when you make them, but I'm not just going to issue them automatically uh, if you don't. Um, are there any questions about the structure of the remaining part of our class? Okay, then let's get started. So um, we're going to be, whoops, what happened? We're going to be talking um, about several different BIPOC and FGLI physicists and how their life stories fit in with the material of this class. So this is Carl Rouse, who was the first African American to earn a physics PhD at Caltech, and the first African American to have a successful career in astrophysics. He was a fellow of the American Physical Society, so that's quite a high honor. It's a clear recognition by the membership of the American Physical Society that Dr. Rouse made really important contributions to astrophysics and was widely recognized as a leader in his field. In particular, his most important contributions were in modeling the sun and how the physics of the sun works. Part of that modeling was how does the energy that is generated in the center of the sun by fusion reactions, how does that energy get out to the surface of the sun. And it gets out by three different mechanisms, convection, conduction, and radiation, and those are the topics of today's class. So, okay, so um, we're going to begin by doing a little lecture demonstration. Let me bring the lights up so you'll be able to see a little bit better. So look at the camera where you can see this red pot. Um, actually, look at the regular, the main camera where you see my face now. I'm holding up two different plates. This one is relatively low mass light. It's made out of plastic. This one is much heavier, higher mass. It's made out of some kind of metal, I suspect probably steel to judge by its density that's been painted with a thin layer of black paint. So other than the materials that they're made out of, they're the same color and the same size. So I'm going to put them here on the table, so look at this camera where you can see them. And I'm just going to put a little rubber O-ring on top of each one. And then I'm going to put an ice cube on each one. And I will tell you that when I put my hand on this one, it feels pretty cold. When I put one, my hand on this one, it doesn't feel cold. They are, in fact, they're both at room temperature. But maybe you've had this experience that when you sit on a metal bench, a uh, metal park bench, it feels colder than when you sit on a wooden bench. And wood is similar in this regard to plastic. So I'm going to put an ice cube on this and a same size ice cube on this one. And I'm not going to make you vote, but I want you to think to yourselves which ice cube is going to melt faster. And we'll do the experiment, 
And then over the course of this class, we'll learn about the physics that explains the result. And I'll ask you to explain that, that result to me using the physics that we've discussed at the end of the class. So I'll get a couple of ice cubes. Put one there on the plastic one. I'll try to get a similar size one. Put on the middle one. And let's just watch this for a minute. I hope you can see it. I'm going to turn my laptop camera, give you a different view of it. So again, this is the metal one here. This is the plastic one here. I think you can already see that the ice is starting to melt on the metal one and it's hardly started to melt at all on the plastic one. So I'm curious, I'm not going to ask you, but think about does that match what you predicted? In fact, I'm going to let this go, go a little bit longer. You can buy plates of metal like this to help you defrost pieces of meat that you've just taken out of your freezer by this same mechanism. And by the end of the class today, hopefully you'll understand this difference in a, a pretty good level of detail. But uh, you can see there's a huge, huge difference. This one on the plastic hardly melted at all. The one on the piece of metal already almost halfway melted. But I'm going to move these over here so don't make too much of a mess for me. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are three modes of heat transfer. Modes of heat transfer. And the first one that we're going to talk about is conduction. So let's imagine that um, you've got a bar. Maybe it's a bar of metal. Let's think of it as being made of metal for now. And it's like a long cylinder. And we're going to apply a blowtorch to the top end of it so that the top end is held at a temperature T1. And the bottom end is going to be immersed in a pot of water. And so the pot of water at some particular time is at temperature T2. So this is kind of a funny way of heating up a pot of water, but it would work. And I hope that it makes sense to you that if T1 is greater than T2, then there would be heat that's being conducted down along this pipe. And let's talk briefly about the microscopic mechanism of how that's happening. We have discussed how when an atom gets hot, it starts to vibrate more with a higher amplitude. So if we look at, at a microscopic scale, the, the atoms up at the top, because they're being heated by that blowtorch, they're vibrating with a larger amplitude. But the atom in the very top layer is connected by electromagnetic forces, which we can model as a spring, to an atom in the next layer down. And so when this top atom starts to vibrate, because it's connected to this one, it's going to cause this one to start vibrating. So that one starts vibrating, and it is connected in turn to an atom in the next row down, and it also starts vibrating. And so that chain of increased vibrations represents the flow of heat from the, to <coughs> Excuse me. From the top to the bottom. Let's say that the rod has a length L and cross-sectional area, cross-sectional area like that, A. We're going to discuss the power, which is power in general is an increment of energy divided by an increment of time. In our particular case, it would be the heat flow in a particular time, delta T. And let's talk about how does the power depend on the cross-sectional area and on the length. So let me ask you a concept test. If the cross-sectional area of the, of the rod goes up, so I make a bigger, fatter rod, but I'm going to keep everything else the same, so keep the length the same, keep the temperature at the two ends the same, does the power go up, 
go down or remain the same. Think about that on your own first. And now go ahead and talk it over amongst yourselves. Um, maybe I will just show you that the ice cube on the metal plate is now completely melted. The ice cube on the plastic plate has hardly melted at all. I got to do a little cleaning up of the water that's all over my table now while you guys talk. So go ahead and talk this over. not hearing any discussion, so that means all of you know the answer, right? Whoops. Uh, you want to take a stab at for us? So remember, I'm keeping the whole, so that would be true, so part of what you said might be true if I was only having one flame here, but what I'm really doing is keeping the whole top at a constant temperature. So one way to think about increasing the area is I could add a second pipe or a second rod like this that also I'm keeping the top of it at this temperature T1. So that would be doubling the area. And what do you think that would do to the heat? Yes, yes. So we can see that the power is actually proportional to that cross-sectional area. So now let's ask a different, different question. How does the, if the length goes up, does the power increase, decrease, or remain the same? And one way that I will encourage you to think about this is imagine you have a rod and instead of immersing the end of it in water, you are grabbing onto it with your hand. So here's your hand and somebody else is applying the blowtorch to this end of it. Would you rather have that happen if the rod, let's say it's made out of metal, if, would you rather have that situation if the rod is 10 centimeters long or 10 meters long? What do you think? How come? Heat is being applied farther away. It's not going to have as much of an effect on you. So we can see that the power is inversely proportional to the length. Now, I want to pause and say that we've made arguments that as the area goes up, the power goes up. As the length goes up, the power goes down. We haven't really shown that it's proportional to 1 over L. It might be proportional to 1 over L squared. Um, but we're doing a somewhat abbreviated treatment, so I'm not going to make that proof for you. In fact, it turns out to be proportional to 1 over R, 1 over L, sorry. And finally, remember that we're keeping the top of the rod at temperature T1 and the bottom at temperature T2. If delta T, which we'll define to be T1 minus T2, if delta T increases, does the power increase, decrease, or remain the same? Think about that on your own briefly. What do you think? So go, it will go up. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Let's say if we take the example where T1 and T2 were the same, there'd be no power that flows. So the bigger the temperature difference, the more heat is going to flow down. So putting all those things that means the power is proportional to the temperature difference. We also, so putting these things together, we can write an equation, the power equals the area times the temperature difference divided by the length. 
But we also want to take into account that if the rod were made out of copper, then more heat would be conducted down it than if it were made out of styrofoam. So there's something that depends on the material. This is meant to be the Greek letter kappa. It looks just like a K, or very similar, but it's really a kappa. And that's called the thermal conductivity. It's a property of the material from which the rod is made. And let me just give you a few numerical values that for copper, the thermal conductivity would be 400 watts per meter Kelvin. For plastic, depends on the exact plastic, but it's about 0 0.2 of these same units. And for air, it's about 0 0.025 of these same units, watts per meter Kelvin. So that's the power due to conduction. Questions so far? All right, let's ask another concept test. If you take a styrofoam cup, so here's the styrofoam cup shown in cross section, and I'm going to fill it with hot coffee. So here's the hot coffee, or fill it part way. And I want to compare that with a paper cup. So here are the thin walls of the paper cup. Now, I think you know that the, paper the coffee in the paper cup would cool more quickly than the coffee in the styrofoam cup. Styrofoam is a mixture of plastic and air. So this the walls of this are made out of a mixture of plastic and air. And so we can see that the thermal conductivity of air is less than the thermal conductivity of plastic. So one could sort of think of this paper cup as being surrounded by a wall of air, sort of. There's a problem with this analogy, but here's some air. And so if we think about heat coming from the hot coffee going to the outside, it has to go through a wall, as it were, of higher thermal conductivity for the paper cup than for the, the styrofoam cup. And so in terms of this mechanism of heat transfer, there would actually be more heat transfer due to conduction in this case than in this case because the thermal conductivity of air is lower than the thermal conductivity of plastic. And yet we know that in fact this one cools off quicker. So I'm going to ask you to call on sort of maybe stuff you knew from other courses or from your own experience to try to explain qualitatively to me why is it that this one cools off faster than this one even though the heat by this mechanism of conduction is actually more by this in the styrofoam case. So think about that on your own for a moment. Okay, go ahead and talk it over amongst yourselves a little bit. So sorry, this one, the left one is styrofoam and the right one is paper. And you know, it's a typical paper cup that has thin walls. Yes, that's part of the explanation, but in fact the plastic part of that conducts heat better than the air part does. So why not get rid of all that plastic? Try to think microscopically. Think about when, what, what's happening to the atoms when they get in touch with the hot coffee. So think about the atoms of air here that are in contact with the hot coffee and the atoms of air here that are in contact, 
basically with the hot coffee. Uh, you're right. So um, that's a correct thing in general. So um, if you take an alloy, let's say a metal that's made, uh, uh, you mix two metals together to make an alloy, that will lower the thermal conductivity. So you're right in that respect that mixing things together in general lowers the thermal conductivity, but that's not the main factor here because, in fact, the styrofoam is almost all air. It's like 90% air. There's a much bigger thing that's going on. Any other ideas? No, because the we can imagine we sort of this our imaginary air wall could be the same thickness as the imaginary styrofoam wall. So let's think about what happens if I have an air molecule right here that's in contact with the hot paper cup. It starts to vibrate because it gets heated. And then what happens? We now have this hot air molecule. What's going to happen to it? What happens to hot air? It rises. And then it's going to be replaced by a cooler air molecule like this. In the styrofoam, that can't happen because the air is trapped in the little bubbles of the styrofoam. So this hot air molecule, it can't, can't rise. It's stuck there. And so it cannot be replaced by colder air. So that is the mechanism of, that's mechanism number two, convection. So um, fluid, and by fluid I mean a gas or a liquid that is heated by a surface. moves away and is replaced by cooler fluid. So that's actually quite important to human beings. So let's say here's, here's a person and they're at temperature T1. They're surrounded by air, which is at temperature T2. For reasons, and let's say that the surface area of the person is capital A, that's the area that's in contact with the surrounding fluid. The power that's being carried away, just like in the previous case, will increase as that surface area increases, and it also increases as the temperature difference increases. And then there's a constant of proportionality called Q which, as far as I know, doesn't have a real name, but we could call it the convection coefficient. And for a person in air, the convection coefficient is about 7.1 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Um, another example of when convection is important is in plumbing. So let's say you're running a pipe that's carrying hot water and you want to know, is it worth the effort to surround that pipe with a layer of insulation? So one of the things, shoot, one of the things you would need to consider in making that decision is how much heat will be carried away by convection. So for a pipe in air, this coefficient has the value of about 9.5 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So you could use that to do that calculation and, and make, make your decision. The final heat mechanism, uh, heat conduction mechanism, is radiation. So every object that is not at absolute zero is emitting, so all objects at temperature greater than zero Kelvin emit electromagnetic radiation. 
This is something you're going to study in great detail next semester. Maybe you've already heard a little bit about it. Electromagnetic radiation is a combination of electric and magnetic fields that can travel through a vacuum and that carry energy. So light, visible light, is an example of electromagnetic radiation. Infrared light is another example. So you might ask, what's the difference in terms of physics between infrared light and visible light? So as I mentioned, light is a combination of electric and magnetic fields. So you'll learn more about exactly what that means, the term electric field next semester. But if I plot the electric field as a function of position for an electromagnetic wave, it might look kind of like this. The distance between the peaks of this sinusoidal variation is the wavelength, and that's the Greek letter lambda. And that's the only difference in terms of physics between infrared light, which we can't see, and visible light, which we can. Infrared light has a longer wavelength. Other forms of radiation include radio waves, which have even longer wavelengths than infrared light. They're they might have wavelengths up to even several miles. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have ultraviolet light, which has a shorter wavelength than visible light, and X-rays, which have an even shorter wavelength, and gamma rays, and other types of com cosmic rays that have even shorter wavelengths. But in terms of physics, they're all the same. They're just different wavelengths of the same kind of electromagnetic radiation. So why is it on a microscopic level that all objects are emitting this electromagnetic radiation if they're not at t equals zero? So we know that objects are made out of atoms. Atoms have a positive nucleus, positively charged nucleus, surrounded by negatively charged electrons. And so when the object starts to wiggle, because it's got some thermal energy, you've got these wiggling charges, and they're not wiggling perfectly in phase. And as you will study next semester, those wiggling charges create wiggling electric and magnetic fields, and that's how you broadcast radiation. So um, let's uh, do a little bit of an experiment with radiation. So I have here uh, a special camera that detects infrared light. Um, so our eyes cannot detect infrared light, but it's easy to make an electronic device that does. And so let me, I'm going to change the screen sharing so you can see the image from this camera. You can see the picture of my face, right? So I'm aiming the camera right at my face. And you can see that there's sort of various different things that maybe don't surprise you, and maybe one thing that does surprise you. So think about what in this image of my face is most surprising to you? Let's start with some things that aren't surprising, at least not to me. So if we look up here, this is my forehead. If you look at my forehead, it looks pretty bright. That means that it's emitting a lot of infrared light. Whereas if you look at my hair or my face mask, it's not as bright. That means it's not emitting as much infrared light. Why do you think that is? Why is it emitting less infrared light? Okay, but so another way of saying is that my cells, my live cells, are at a higher temperature than my hair or my face mask. So what we're seeing is things that are hot emit more infrared light than things that are cold. Another way to, to show that is I'm aiming the camera now just at the table that's in front of me. So I guess you can see that. And here's my hand above the table. You can see my hand, it's at human body temperature, so it's emitting more infrared light than the table. 
Now I'm going to press my hand down on the table. Let me try to get over it where I'm holding it on the table, and now I'm going to remove my hand. That's the imprint left behind by my hand where I warmed up the table. And because it's warmer, it emits more infrared light. I'll do it one more time. So there's my hand on the table. And then I remove it. And you can see the imprint and sort of gradually starts to fade as the table cools off. So what we're seeing from this is that things that are higher temperature emit more infrared light. So the power that's emitted is going to increase as the temperature goes up. While I've got this camera, let me again show my face. What's something that's quite surprising? To me, it was surprising when I first saw it about this picture. I'm not wearing sunglasses, but my glasses look dark. So what is that telling you in terms of what's going on? Yes. So regular glass transmits visible light very well, but it blocks infrared light. And that's the principle behind a greenhouse. The visible light can come in, and it heats up the stuff in the greenhouse, but then that the radiation that's coming off of that is blocked and held in by the, um, by the glass of the greenhouse. So let me resume sharing here. So what we just saw is that the power that's emitted by radiation goes up with the temperature. In fact, it goes up as the fourth power of the temperature. We're not going to prove that, but you can show that experimentally. It also goes up as the area of the thing that's emitting increases. And it's proportional to a constant, which is called Stefan's constant. Stefan's constant has a value 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. And it also depends on a quantity called the emissivity, which we're going to talk about briefly now. So let me just go ahead and finish this equation. The emissivity is something that is a property of the surface of the material. So it depends on the surface material of the object. And the emissivity equals 1 for an object that is so-called perfectly black. And it equals 0 for an object that is perfectly reflective. So what that's saying, according to this equation, is that a black object emits more radiation at the same temperature than a white object. Let's try to understand why that would have to be the case. Let's say you've got a black cube that is in a room. So here's a black cube. And it's been in the room for a while. And we all know that if it's been in the room for a long time, it will come to the same temperature as the room. Black, from a scientific perspective, what that means is that it absorbs light, including infrared light. So a black object has it's being bombarded by infrared light from its surroundings because everything emits some infrared light. In the camera, a lot of things look black. That's just because of the way that it was adjusting the contrast automatically. But in fact, everything that's not at zero temperature, zero Kelvin, is emitting infrared light. So this black cube is absorbing that infrared light. And if it did not also emit it efficiently, it would start getting hotter. But that doesn't happen. It stays at room temperature. So to 
heat at room temperature, the black cube must emit efficiently. So it must emit a lot of radiation as well as absorbing it. So let's put that to the test experimentally. So let me change over my screen sharing again. Whoops. Stop sharing. picture again. Uh, I guess you guys can still see the camera, the regular camera, is that right? Okay, so I've got two bottles here the same size. This one is made out of something shiny and this one is made out of something black. So this would have an emissivity close to zero. It's not perfectly zero, but a small emissivity. This has an emissivity close to one. And I've got some hot water here. Still pretty hot. So I'm going to fill the two bottles with the hot water. And then let's point the infrared camera at them. So white means a lot of infrared light is being emitted, black means not as much. So um, you can see, hopefully it's less confusing for you guys than it is for me, but that the, this one, I'll put my finger above the black bottle, oh, come on, stop that. this one, it, it can't even see my hand because I'm cold compared to it. This is the black bottle that I'm grabbing onto now. And you can see that it is, in fact, brighter than the other bottle, the aluminum bottle. They're at the same temperature because they're both filled with the same hot water, but the black one is emitting more than the silvery one. Questions? All right, so now let's go back to the thing we started with at the very beginning, these two cubes in that melted, where the one on the metal plate, it melted completely, the one on the plastic plate melted way more slowly, it's still mostly unmelted. I want you to think, using these ideas that we've discussed, and maybe some stuff that we've discussed earlier in this class, why did it happen that way? So think about that on your own briefly. And now let's talk about it amongst everybody who has some ideas about this. Yes, so we said that the, for, for copper it was 400, compared to plastic it was 0.2. Now this isn't copper, it's probably steel, but it's still going to be a lot higher than plastic. Why does that explain why the ice cube melted faster on the metal plate. Exactly, yes. And so it's the air is warm. Let me get a just drop that one, but I use the plastic one anyway. So the air is warm, so heat is flowing from the air via convection mostly into the plastic. The plastic can convey that by conduction into the ice, but the metal conveys it by conduction faster into the ice, and that causes the ice to melt more quickly. So there's more conduction. Uh, so presumably the convection coefficients are about the same because the surfaces of these two things are similar. And the radiation is about the same because they're both black, but there's more conduction in the case of the metal one. 
Another thing that's going on has to do with the mass. Remember that the mass of the metal plate was bigger than the mass of the plastic. And so if you think about how much energy, sort of you think about the, the energy that's available in that Q equals MC delta T, right? So there is the, the energy that's available because of the, 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 the mass of the object is greater in the case of the metal plate. So for a given small temperature change, so let's say one degree temperature change of each block, you'd be transferring more energy out of the metal plate than the plastic plate just because its mass is higher. So final question, why is it that when the two plates were at room temperature, the metal plate felt colder to my hand? But yes, when I put my hand on it, because it has a higher conducti thermal conductivity, it sucks the heat. It's at a lower temperature than my hand, so it sucks the heat away faster. All right, that's a good place for us to stop for today.